I'm Amanda Olke, Adult Education Director at the International Spy Museum. We're talking to James Schroeds, the author of Spies in Palestine, Love, Betrayal, and the Heroic Life of Sarah Aronson. Hi, Jim. Hi, Amanda, once Hi. again. Once again, good to see you. So this is, I'm going to start with a very easy question. What do you mean by this very epic title? Well, just exactly what it, for, for once this is a book title, subtitle, that uh, is literally true. Uh, because she was a young Palestinian Jewish woman at the turn of the century who had all the romantic love you would want. And she was systematically betrayed and at the end of her life did something really spectacularly heroic in that she ran a spy operation for the British against the Turks while she was isolated in Palestine during World War I. Wow. So this is Sarah Aronson. Sarah Aronson. Tell, how, why is she in Palestine? What, what time period is this? You've said World War I, but well, she was, sketch it out. She was uh, the daughter of a family of prosperous Romanian Jews who chose in the 1880s to be part of a movement to go back to Palestine, mm -hmm. to reclaim the Jewish homeland, Zion, mm -hmm. and to uh, farm it, bring it back to the biblical garden of the Lord. And so this family, a, a band of other people, pioneers, you can think of some sort of American Western mm -hmm. image, um, arrived in this desolate part of Palestine and started to try to farm it. And, and uh, w with the rescue uh, of a French nobleman who was Jewish and a Zionist, uh, one of the Rothschilds, uh, they became fairly prosperous. She grew up, instead of being a Roma Romanian ghetto Jewish daughter, uh, grew up as kind of a frontier princess. Wow. Uh, she had her own horse. She became a pistol shot. Uh, she rode fearlessly out into Arab territory. Um, yeah, who's controlling Palestine at that Turks. point? The it, Turks. It, it, it was part of what had once been the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. which had stretched literally the length of the Mediterranean coast all the way up to, literally to the gates of Vienna. Uh, in, in the 13th century. But by the end of the 19th century, it was a pretty corrupt, corroded, sclerotic. Um, yeah. uh, and Syria, Palestine, as it was, which is now Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, and the Palestinian state, um, was one province, not well run, um, and the Turks were remarkably tolerant of the initial Jewish immigrants. That's what I was wondering. That's... Because of all the people they didn't like worse were the Arabs. Okay. They were all Muslims, but the Turks had a racial bias against their co-religionists. And they saw the Jews as kind of a layer of influence that they could slide in between themselves and the Arabs. So initially, they got along. And, and uh, there was a brief window of opportunity. Um, it's a point I'm, I want to stress about this book. There was a brief window of opportunity in which the Israeli Jews and the Israeli Arabs had an opportunity to band together against a common enemy, right. the Turks. Wow. And why, why did? Well, this is the, the, one of the tragedies. Um, Sarah grows up beautiful, red hair, blue eyed. Um, the belle of the village, um, but not having anything to do with the young men that were offered to her. And uh, what she became was a devoted secretary to a older brother, Aaron Aronson who became an internationally famous agriculturalist. Um, and he would go off into the mountains of uh, Palestine looking for 
plants that he could crossbreed. And uh, he made a major discovery that made him literally written up in the New York Times. Um, and, uh, and this is all before World all War I. All before. And that's how she could have lived her life. And according to the custom of the time, um, she did fall in love with a very charismatic young man who became uh, Aaron Aronson's secretary. Um, and he proposed. She wouldn't, she wouldn't uh, accept him. Why? Well, she saw something headstrong and, and undisciplined and, and a little crazy. And so he turned around and proposed to her younger sister. That had to hurt. And don't you think the younger sister? <laughs> what did she say? Yeah, ha, ha, uh -huh. ha. Yeah. And uh, uh, according to the culture of uh, that community, a younger sister couldn't marry until the older sister right. had married. Right, right. So Sarah was packed off to Constantinople to a wealthy Jewish merchant who was about 15 years older than she was. And that's where she was when World War I broke out. Mm -hmm. World War I was a surprise to most Turks who saw no real reason to get involved. Right, it seems far away. But the German military had made friends with the generals who were running Turkey at that time. And they convinced them that a surgical strike, a phrase we use even today, could gain them the Suez Canal and the lost province of Egypt. Oh my, and the Germans, very tempting. And the Germans would help them, they'd send troops and generals and, and cannons and so on. And the Turks fell for it. and. Uh, in preparing for that, we come on to the tragedy of their genocide of the Armenian nation. It's a word that didn't exist until then. And it literally means the extermination of a people. Why did they, I, I, we don't want to lose Sarah's no. story, but a, but a few words, well, why, did, why did the Turks do that? There is in our human nature, I'm sorry to say, a temptation to, when things become unstable and uncertain, mm -hmm. look for another and other. Some people, if we could just get rid of them, and we're going through this in the world right now. Yes. Uh, we're afraid of immigrants of all kinds. Mm -hmm. They're not like us. Uh, the Armenians were Christian. They were also advocating their own nation status, which the Turks weren't having. And so the answer was, kill all the Armenians. And Sarah, witnessing this from Constantinople, the reports, suddenly realizes her family is in jeopardy. Why were, in Palestine. Why were they in jeopardy? Well, because if you could do it to the Armenians, you could do it to the Jews. Oh, wow. They Remember, they had come from Europe mm -hmm. because the Russians and all of Eastern Europe were in raiding and they were called pogroms. Right. They were called uh, clean, ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so... So Sarah, she really did that calculation? It, well, well, it was even worse than that. She ran for it. She got a... a fellow who would be her guide, and she got the passes and got on the train and headed home and ran into the Armenian massacre. Literally bodies stacked beside the railroad tracks. Horrifying. Uh, children holding up starving babies uh, to the passing cars. Take my baby, take my baby. Uh, it took her six weeks to get home. And when she got home, she was in a state of shock. She said, to her brothers, we've got to do something. Uh, we have got to go to the British and help them invade us and save us. And uh, after all, the British had promised, uh, their foreign secretary, Arthur Balfour, had promised Jews a homeland in Palestine after the war. And if we help them, 
that'll seal that deal. Yeah. And so the brothers started doing kind of rudimentary spy work. Uh, and one thing that's very interesting that you alluded to earlier that I'm sure played in the, the trips into the wilderness to look for plants. Tell us how, what kind of trade craft that provided. Well, it, it for one thing gave Aaron Aronson his own map of where the Bedouin wells. Now, think about Lawrence of Arabia, mm -hmm. the, the movie, uh, which opens with a man being killed for using the wrong well. And so the wells for the Bedouin were literally life's blood, mm -hmm. but they were mostly underground and kept secret. Uh, and the British, all armies in those days, were largely horse-driven. Right. And as the British generals said, uh, we can feed our troops beer, but we've got to feed our horses water. And so there's no way for us to get across that desert. Without water. But Aaron Aronson said, I can show you where the water is. Uh, but the Brits didn't know this. So the trick then became for Aaron and several other relatives and this lover of hers uh, to reach the British. And the British, of course, were skeptical. Yeah. They were always looking a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, so here were these Jews, Jews in Palestine, that's odd, uh, offering to work for free, that's odder still, yes. against the Turks. That made no sense at all. So for several years, 1915, 1916, uh, the Aronson brothers were away from Palestine. And gradually, bit by bit, as we will outline in the book, Sarah ends up running and expanding uh, this spy organization. So that when they finally do get British acceptance right. and support, uh, she is able to give what the British field marshal said was the Turkish order of battle. The name of every unit, the number of soldiers, the types of weapons, where they were, what the grand strategy was, what their cap capacity for carrying out that strategy was, how much were they dependent on the Germans. Uh, and this was all, this is gleaned from reports that she, she is receiving? She got a network of Jews, Arabs, and some Turks uh, who were functionaries, helpers of the British, uh, Turkish army. Um, there was one doctor who examined every Turkish soldier going to the front and coming back with wounds and interviewed every one of them. So that he was able to report that they had mishandled their weapons to the point that there was only one functioning rifle for two soldiers. Oh my gosh, and, and did, did the people, did everyone who was involved with her know they were passing information oh, yes. on this? So it was very, very it, straightforward. These are supporters of and, the allies and, and... Well, there were people who did it for money. Okay, and, like any good spy ring. And there were people who did it for their own selfish revenge motives. Mm. But most of them, and all of the Jews, were there to force the British to redeem the promise of mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the betrayal came, of course, uh, sadly enough, as the Turks suddenly, suddenly realized that there was a spy ring largely because of British incompetence. Um, the British sent gold coins that helped fund, but were minted after the British embargo and blockade of the, of the uh, Palestinian uh, coast. And so the counter spy, Colonel Beck, says, where's this money coming from? The devil is in the details, yeah, absolutely. right? Absolutely. And they were using carrier pigeons um, to get messages back to Cairo. And uh, the pigeons ended up flying into the coop of a police chief, a Turkish oh, police no, chief. no, no, this who's, is terrible. Who said, look at this, oh, this is a strange bird. What's this little capsule on his leg? 
So gradually the net became tighter and tighter, but she soldiered on because it was clear that the British were coming. They were going to invade, and with Aaron's information and with her current intelligence, they were going to get through finally. And you've said the brothers are gone. They're gone. Are they in Europe? Are they doing? What are they doing? Well, uh, one brother and the younger sister mm -hmm. end up going to the United States and fundraising. Okay. And the older brother ends up in Cairo, doing struggle with Lawrence of Arabia. Mm -hmm and the British intelligence people who were committed to an Arab Palestine. Ah. They had made promises to the Arab tribes that you will have the country. And it was a promise they never intended to keep. To keep. But it was also, a, you might say it was a sincere promise, because they had no idea of giving it to the Jews either. It, it was going to be a British province. They had made a deal with the French that the French would get Syria and Lebanon, and they would get south to the Suez Canal, wow. protect that lifeblood, and protect Egypt, which they had seized. And so they had no, no intention of, of keeping either promise. No. But Sarah doesn't know that. She's, She's you know. She's there on the ground, right. uh, traveling. Uh, she was, as I said, very good looking, and with a, uh, an accompanying man, they would go to the hotels and the big cities and hang out in the lobby and drink tea and, and consort with the German officers. She was fluent in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. And so she would overhear uh, and was able to document uh, when the Germans suddenly started to withdraw troops back to France. Uh, this is 1917, and the Germans are trying to build up a, an offensive before the American army arrives. Right, right. So it's all interwoven, and she's operating in a complete vacuum, uh, and was told repeatedly, to, you've done enough, come out, come to Cairo, we'll, it'll all be done. She wouldn't do it because she, was, she wasn't going to leave the network alone, and she knew the British were coming any moment. And sadly, uh, when the Turks did catch her, uh, British invasion was about two months away. So what, when did they catch her? What, what? They caught her in October of 1917. Now, were they surprised that this was a, that their spy ring, the spy master, was a mistress? They didn't believe it. They thought she, the, the, the mastermind was her father, who by this time was in his, uh, was quite elderly and, mm -hmm. and, and had no idea of what was going on. So they tortured him rather, rather roundly and a brother who also didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, finally, they focused in on her, and it is very hard reading at the end of the book of yeah. what was done to her, but rather than try to bargain, she taunted them. And, uh, and the Turks were, probably one of the things the Turkish military did well was torture people. Horrible. They weren't very much good at anything else, but they sure could torture the bejeebers out of you. And, uh, but they had, it, again, a kind of silly gentlemanliness about torturing women. Well, I was wondering about that. Uh, it didn't stop them from torturing. Uh, but then they said, well, you're not talking, you're not telling us everything. We're going to take you back to Nazareth where we really have some nice things to show you. And she said, well, look, what, you know, you've torn my dress, I'm all bloody. Uh, can I go home and clean up? And they said, well, all right. So they march her through the village. And uh, she says, I'm, I'm going into the bathroom now. <laughs> and of course, they let her go into the bathroom and close the right, door. Right. Because you, I mean, you they're don't not look gonna at a, go in you, with a lady. Yeah, to that's a, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of the, uh, the loony, side of this story. And there she had secreted a pistol uh, and attempted to take her life. Um, and then, as I say, uh, by Christmas 1917, Field Marshal Allenby marched into Jerusalem. 
And G is gone, but he has arrived with all the information that, that she and her spy ring have provided. And they took Turkey out of the war uh, well before 1918 and uh, was really the first major Allied victory. Um, yeah, I was, that was so interesting to me. That's kind of a little buried for those of us who are not as... Yeah, well, you, we think of World War I being the trenches in France. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this was, a, uh, this was a very active field of battle, <coughs> and uh, the victory was very important. So how was, was Sarah saluted for her role in this victory? Was she recognized? That is another part of the story. Um, that has been written about elsewhere. Uh, Aaron wanted to get the World Zionist Organization. By this time, there was a formal organization based in Denmark um, of Americans and, and European Jews who were raising money and advocating a portion of Palestine for a Jewish mm -hmm. homeland. And the leader in Britain was a man named Chaim Weizmann, who later became Israel's first president. And he was a chemist who had given all of his patents to the British war effort. He was very inter influential with the British. And he, uh, he and the World Zionist Organization, for all of that, refused to endorse the Allied side. Because the Germans had said, well, we'll give you a homeland. We'll give mm -hmm, you a homeland. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they hedged their bet. That brought him into direct conflict with Aaron, oh. who wrote articles, who wrote letters. I quote a letter from him to Weizmann that's really fairly insulting. Uh, so that when Weizmann and others became the first uh, presidents leaders, of, the yeah, leaders of, yeah. of Israel, the Aronson's story just, a little, just disappeared. Yeah. And it remained untold largely until about the 1970s when a new generation of Israeli historians mm -hmm. started looking at the, at the archives. Uh, and it is at about that time that I stumbled on my first references to the Aronsons uh, when I was doing the biography of Alan Dulles. And, 20 years ago. Wow, and you've just always had it in the back of I your mind? swirled a little bit here, a little bit there. There would be these vague references. Uh, and there was indeed an article that, that postulated that Lawrence of Arabia and Sarah, Sarah had had a romance, uh, except for the fact that they never met. Uh, that can be tricky in a romance. But it is true that in Lawrence's famous memoir, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It's dedicated to her. And why was that? Because he was a shapeshifter. Mm -hmm. He created more identities for himself than most people have suits. Um, and he ended up not being Lawrence of Arabia at all, changing his name and joining the Royal Air Force as a mechanic. But while he was being Lawrence of Arabia, uh, he cheerfully adopted the Sarah Aronson myth, uh, which I find both sad and, and uh, a little bittersweet. Well, it's wonderful that she now has a very clear-eyed, ah. by I, I won't say by a history of what she did and her spying and her efforts and. You've written about a number of spies and spy-related people, from Ben Franklin to Alan Dulles to presidential circles. What are the commonalities that, that you find in all these books? Well, obviously, the espionage. Right. Um, but all of these people attracted my interest, my curiosity, mm -hmm. because they started off with one kind of life laid out for them. And then there's a crisis of one kind or another, and they end up becoming totally different people. And I mean, Ben, ben Franklin could have stayed a printer in Philadelphia, been wealthy, influential, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and comfortable. But for 30 years, 
he was away from America in Britain, in Paris, fighting for independence. Uh, Alan Dulles was supposed to be a Presbyterian minister, which is what his father was. Uh, he ends up as our preeminent spy chief and the, both the creator and the longest serving director of the CIA. Uh, Sarah, as I said, could have been just another ghetto Jewish girl and an, uh, an unhappy one at that. But you're not supposed to be happy. No, uh, no. You're supposed to be dutiful. Uh, instead, the crisis of World War I, the horror of the Armenian genocide, which is still not acknowledged by I, the yeah, church. Yeah. Um, the horror of that and the obvious conclusion that nobody's safe once you start that sort of uh, homicide. And uh, she adapted to that in ways that were really surprising even to her own brother. Yeah, it sounds like this took on a life of its own for her and she was running with it. Absolutely. Well, Jim, thank you so much. I fascinated by her and really glad to have a chance to talk well, with you. Well, it is you. always good to be here, my second home. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.